Hello, hello, hello. This is Aaron Stoller once again with a live stream. This time we are coming from the Wetlands Institute uh, in southern New Jersey, just north of Cape May and south of the Ocean City. Um, a beautiful area, as you can see right in front of me. The Wetlands Institute is responsible for an incredible amount of research as well as a lot of public education. Look guys, thank you so much for tuning in. As always with these live streams, please, please, please ask questions. I really do hope that you guys have some great questions to ask. We have some research scientists here with us that are going to really uh, help you out with whatever you would like to know. Um, and just keep the conversation going so I don't have to constantly ask those questions, all right? So with that, let me go and knock on this door and find my good friend Samantha, who is a research scientist here at... Uh, Oh, she's not there. There we go. <laughs> Hello, Hi, how, are how are you doing? Welcome to the Wetlands Institute. My name's Sam. I'm a research scientist. Come on in. Let's Oop, explore a little bit. There we go. So this is our Wetlands Institute for those that have been here before. Um, this is our main entrance. This is where you come to um, meet our lovely <laughs> missions person. Um, where you'll learn a little bit about our institute. And right now we're gonna head up to our viewing platform. Oh man, we get a special oh, tour, we get a special tour. So you guys are still open for business. If people wanted to come, they could still come on the trails. You guys are open on the weekends, yes? Yes, the trails are open every day. Oh, every um, day, okay. The institute um, is open for admissions on the weekend. Excellent. Can people come up to this to this uh, tower on the, right now? Unfortunately, the tower is closed right now. As you can see, as we're going up, it's very tight corridors. Um, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, very uh -oh. twisty. It's very... one of them. It's one of them swirly <laughs> stairs. All right, all right. So we're gonna get a special tour that other people can't get right yeah. now. But next summer, next summer you and can. Be sure Check out the artwork on your way up. There's some really pretty paintings on guys, the walls I'm of dizzy. all our species. Guys, guys, I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> oh no. All right, all right, all right. I know you guys are just staring at a stairwell. Okay, 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 okay. And we're at the top. Oh, okay. And we're heading High elevation, I can't breathe. All right, so. <laughs> guys, also just shoot me a message just so if you can, just to let me know if the audio is okay. Oh, this is beautiful. So to give you guys a little intro on myself, um, as a research scientist here, my main responsibility is studying coastal birds. Uh, so I develop and implement research on those birds, uh, but I also help out with a lot of the different programs here. And we're going to get into some of those today, like terrapins, horseshoe crabs, um, a lot of the critters of the marsh, and also the marsh itself, studying the plants, the water, all of that stuff. We got a special treat for you. They're going to let us into the aquarium and we're going to get to see some of these critters up close. Yeah, and there's some really neat ones down there. Maybe um, we'll get attacked by an octopus right here. It's possible. <laughs> Hank is it's very possible. His name is Hank. His name we're is We're going to get to see Hank the octopus. <laughs> uh, so feel free to take a great view of our marsh here. Um, we're located on 6,000 acres of marsh. 6,000 acres. 6,000 acres. And these views are available on our website. Um, if you go on our website, we do have live feeds of our marsh. And when the season is right, you can even see our osprey nesting on the platform, which you can see in the distance there. There's no osprey there right now, I don't nope. think. Nope, so the osprey is- Guys, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it with my finger. It's like right there. You guys see it? It's like right there. All right. <laughs> so the ospreys, they're here. Uh, they start nesting in March. They usually lay one to two eggs. Sorry for the wind, guys. I know it's really windy. I don't have the really expensive version of the microphones. We'll move out of the wind in a second. All right, go ahead. Oh, we can block off the wind a little bit. Um, so our local osprey here, um, they're affectionately known as Marshall and Lily. Um, so if you see them on the webcams, they did really well this year. They fledged three chicks. Now these guys usually lay two to three eggs. So to fledge three chicks, that's pretty good. Um, fledge, that's a word. Fledge. So fledge, fledge means when the chicks leave the nest when they actually fly. So right, right, they do right. stay in the nest where the parents are taking care of them. And then once they get big enough and their wings get strong enough, they actually do. That's um, what fly. I did when I went off to college, I fledged. <laughs> so the ospreys are a really great story because they're a really big comeback story. Uh, so these guys were endangered in the mid 1900s um, because mostly DDT, if anybody heard of DDT back home, it's a chemical that was used and it was released into the food chain and some of these birds were um, having diminished reproductive success because of it. 
So uh, DDT was down here too? DDT was oh, down man, here Oh man, that chemical well. was everywhere. Yeah. You know, if you don't know DDT, just look, up, look it up and you'll see these black and white pictures of people spraying DDT in people's faces. <laughs> because that's what we did. We wanted to get rid of mosquitoes. We were really, really worried about mosquitoes. And so we started spraying this chemical called DDT. I don't know what it stands for. <laughs> uh, whatever um, and we were spraying it and we thought it was completely safe for the environment and it wasn't it, it was pretty bad and it took a, a lot of a lot of writing to anyways that's Rachel Carson silent spring you can look it up okay so continue on <laughs> so these guys did have a lot of problems with that they also have problems with as you can see from here coastal development is a big recurring theme that we're gonna be talking about here today um, coastal development um, is taking away some of the marshes that these birds used to have for habitat. Um, so these birds used to historically nest on snags, which is dead trees. They used to also nest in live trees that just had dead parts in them. And there weren't as many around this time, along with DDT. Um, and so these birds went endangered around the 1970s. So we went from about 400 pairs to about 50 pairs around that time. And these guys had a great success story because Scientists started thinking of ways that we can recreate habitat and make nesting areas for these birds, and they developed these man-made platforms that you might see as you're driving along the coast. Um, it's so, like a condo for an osprey. It is kind of like a condo for an they osprey. They don't pay condo fees. They get it for free. <laughs> and now here on the It's East like coast, they don't even know they're in Jersey. <laughs> and now they mostly Dang. nest in these man-made platforms. So you'll see them in these um, platforms that we've made. You'll also see them on channel markers. And they do really well and these birds uh, came back to that 400 nest mark in 2013. Wow. So it took them about 20 years or so to finally or longer than that to finally come back um, but they hit that historic landmark in 2013 and it only increased since then. Now I know that I know that uh, you, you kind of hinted at it but let's just make it clear why are ospreys so important? for this for this beautiful view here why why would we spend your tax money on making these bird condos that they're not even paying for um why why do we need ospreys so along with all the other species here they're a really important part of the ecosystem they're a part of the food chain everything is connected here in the marsh so if we want to see them and enjoy them for the future it's really important that we work with not just the osprey um, but with the other species as well to make sure that they continue on uh, for future generations to enjoy and to make sure uh, this habitat is uh, preserved. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? So, I mean, I teach my students ecology. Here, I'll, I'll just show you the view. If you got rid of the ospreys that eat the big fish, you know what's going to happen? The big fish are going to get really, the population is going to skyrocket, and then they're going to eat all the little fish. And if they eat all the little fish, then there's nothing that the little, then the little fish, all the things that they were eating, like the plankton, they skyrocket, and then the whole system goes out of control. You need to have the top predator, those ospreys there. So thank you, we've got a bunch of people. Thanks, Ray, yeah, it's a beautiful day. Barbara says, great view, been a while since we've seen it. Yeah, I'm glad I could bring it to you, at least virtually right now. They're still open, they are still willing to take you on a trail. Um, just keep your distance and wear a mask. Um, and uh, for those of you just tuning in, thank you very much. My name is Aaron Stoller. Sorry about the wind, we'll move out of it in a little bit. We're going to give you guys a cool tour of their aquarium, show you some of their diamondback terrapins. And I'm here with Sam, uh, who is a research scientist. She's been here for a year and a half. Um, and yeah, like I said, we're at the Wetlands Institute. And please, please, please ask questions. Keep the conversation going. There's only so many dad jokes that I can tell in a given time before I run out of steam. So, all right, with that, I'm just going to take them on a quick tour around here. Oh, the wind. Oh, the wind. Sorry, guys. Sorry. All right. Let's go see some cool stuff. And you're back. All right. So hopefully we'll get closer views of some of these creatures. I do see some in the distance that you probably can't see at home. What are we looking at? We see some egrets off the, the platform egrets. way over there. Oh, um, yeah, I see them. I don't know if you can see them. I'll try to well, get... there is there's a really like, nice It's like one. a little white dot somewhere yeah. around right there. Can you see it? No, they can't Not see really, it. Not really, but we are going to go out to that platform and hopefully we can see them up close and I can talk about them a little excellent, more for you Excellent, okay, excellent. Let's head back downstairs down the winding oh, stairway. Oh, God, I'm going to fall. Please don't fall because I'm below you. Yeah, well, you can catch me. Oh, goodness. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, let me point the camera down and show you what I'm about to die on. All right, all right, I can do this. It's now a bad time to tell you that I'm scared of heights. Just kidding, I'm not. I'm fine. I went skydiving a couple years ago. It was amazing. 
People don't really have a fear of heights. They have a fear of landing. Well, you made it, though. <laughs> Luckily, you didn't fall on me. Nobody has an actual fear of heights. It's a fear of not having a floor to land on. And we're back downstairs. Nice. So this is our tadpole shop. So if you come visit the Institute, this is one of the areas you can come. Get some really cool souvenirs. Yeah, I saw this. I got my eye. Them. I got my eye on this one right here. I like yeah. the Look at those. Those are gorgeous. Well, okay. I really, I really like these. These uh, hand carved. I really want one of those. Those are pretty. Neat. Okay, I'll steal it. But we got all kinds of T-shirts and don't stuff steal, like folks. That. It's not good. Hats. I got some hats at home. We all also right. have all these carvings. If you want to learn more about some of the birds of the marsh, uh, we have some. Right, so you guys have like essentially two two main initiatives here is research and education. Yes. And so I mean education, they don't take that they don't take that lightly. They really do uh, care about educating the, the the community around the tourists that come. They have a whole program where they get students out here over the summer, not this past summer. Oh, look at that! That's a, who is that? That is an otter, and then to the left is that osprey we were talking about. Oh, but he's dead. Let's go see a real osprey. Oh, he's got a fish. Got a fish. Oh, that's fun. Okay. Awesome. Enough, enough of carved and dead animals. Right. Let's go see some live stuff. We do have an online type oh. shop as well. If you are um, interested in purchasing anything and can't make it in here, um, we have that as well. But I just wanted to show you, this is our lecture hall. Oh, yeah. Um, so do you guys, our... guys give public, public seminars? Uh, yeah, we do uh, nice. lunch and learns. Um, and we do seminars. We do meetings. We do all kinds of stuff in this room. Did you say lunch and learns? Yeah. When you get to have lunch? Yep, you can have lunch, nice. and we do presentations where you can learn about different stuff. Last year, I did a presentation on oyster catchers, and you can learn about some of the birds I've banded and where they're moving um, and stuff like that. So if we come over here, um, you can probably see if you point out the window over here. If you haven't been here to the Institute, um, those are our purple martin boxes. Again, everything's kind of empty right now because the birds have all left to vacation in the south. Those aren't boxes. These are gourds. Yeah, gourds. Have... Get your shapes right. <laughs> they do have boxes. We have children on here that know more than you do. Okay. <laughs> Did somebody correct me? No. <laughs> so, uh, cool, uh, th cool thing about the gourds to point out, um, historically, we came up with these gourds because historically the Native Americans used to hollow out their gourds oh. and use those as uh, boxes for the, or nest boxes for the uh, birds. And they started using those and we kind of adopted that. And now the birds pretty much only nest in these man-made um, boxes or gourds, uh, especially here on the east. More coast. condominium residents that aren't paying their rent. <laughs> Man, but we just bought a house in New Jersey. I'm afraid to tell you what we paid for it, but this is New Jersey. They should they should start paying rent. We've got butterflies in here, guys. These are monarchs, right? Yep. Yeah, check so out those they are processes. currently in metamorphosis. So they will be in metamorphosis for about two weeks. Um, and when they are about to close, which means they're about to come out of that metamorphosis and become butterflies, uh, it gets very dark. You can see on this little drawing here, they're an egg for seven to ten days. Then they're those caterpillars for about two weeks. And then they do this and thing. And they do this, and that's where Guys, they're Guys, right I'm going to tell you something I just learned. All right, so when they go from this to this, inside here, if you open this up, it doesn't look like a caterpillar and it doesn't look like a butterfly. It actually looks like just white goo. Like literally, it's just white goo. I'm, I'm not even joking. Like it, the people finally, I, I don't know why it took us so long to open up a chrysalis, but apparently, like there's a brain floating around in there somewhere, but they can't find it. <laughs> All right. So what are we doing? All right. So now we are heading into the lab area. So this is where I spend most of my time. This is where our offices are, and also um, where some of our terpen work goes on. So oh, I'm going to start talking this about some of our This is a place where the terpen. public does not get to go. All right, so we're we getting we're getting a sneak the peek. Okay, so I'm going to start off over here and kind of introduce. This is our main lab bench area where we do a lot of our work, especially in the summertime. We have a summer internship program. Um, so the the interns, a lot of their duties are um, dedicated to the terrapin program. So they do road patrols um, where they're going out there in the roads and they're trying to help those terrapins cross the road if they see them out there. They're also keeping track of any that have been hit by cars. This board I hit, have here is kind of the results from this past year. Um, we try to uh, save more than actually get killed. Again, we don't have as much control over how the cars are driving. It's important we tell people at home, um, especially in the summer months, drive slow. 
This is sad, guys. This is is sad. sad. Um, Why are they on the roads? So it's mostly the females that are coming up. So these guys live in the marshes. Uh, They are adapted for brackish marshes, unlike most turtles. And the females will come up. And we built a road straight through their marsh. Yep. We built a road straight through their marsh. And so, of course, they're going to come up on that road because they're like, oh, this is a cool rock. I'm going to go lay on it for a little bit and then search for a place to put my eggs. And then, boom, they get hit by a car. Yep. So, unfortunately, (sighs) we try to help out with that. We try to let people know to be driving slow, watch out for them. Um, We do have signs out on the road telling you when it's a really big day for them to be coming on the roads. Um, But uh, this is kind of the result of that. Nice. If we do find uh, dead terrapins, which we do, unfortunately, during the season, um, we do something called an eggectomy. And we do that right here in our lab bench. Um, and what we do is... There's not an eggectomy happening right there. There is not. No. Nope, it is not the season. Unfortunately, when everything's going on, we are so busy, and we didn't have time to, mm-hmm. to do a lot of these interviews at that time. So we're just talking about them right That's now. That's okay. Um, and... We it's a delicate procedure. I don't want to be around people when they're doing it because you, you you risk damaging the eggs when you're taking them out. Yeah, so you have to be very careful. But basically, that female is already dead, but she has viable eggs inside of her. Yep. Um, so we actually extract those eggs. And then we bring those eggs, which we can show you. We bring them over here, um, and we incubate them. So believe Ooh. it or not, this cabinet over here doesn't really look like much, but it's actually an incubator. And we put the eggs in here. Well, folks, an incubator is just a place where the temperature stays the same. Yep. All right. Um, and we incubate those until they hatch. Uh, and when they hatch, can those... You, can you pull one out? Yes. Sweet. I can pull one out. So this time of the year, we don't have any eggs. They've all hatched. Um, but we do have hatchlings, which I can show you. Nice. Um, and our temperature settings for our incubator is set for females. Um, and the thought of that is that we're replacing... The females that we lost on the roadways. So, so it's guys, in case you didn't know, m- unlike humans, which we have, like, what gender we are, well, what sex we are, actually, sorry, what sex we are set from, uh, from, set from conception, turtles actually have the capacity to switch their sex during development, and it's called temperature-dependent development, where if you raise them at... A, I think it's a low or a very high temperature, it's a female, and if you raise them at a middle temperature, it's a male. Or is it the other so way around? It's at a high temperature, it's female. At lower temperatures, oh, it's male. Oh, guys, see, I'm yep. wrong. <laughs> Stockton, you guys should fire me. All right. <laughs> yep. Okay, you guys ready? Well, I mean, I am. I don't know about they. Here they are. <gasps> oh, they're so cute. Oh, sorry. Would you like yeah. to see one up close? They are very adorable Oh my god. Squishy. Oh, don't squish them. <laughs> So cute, what's what's they? his name or her name? Her, it's all their hers. Right now, so these guys go to classrooms where they help take care of them uh, and make sure they're good Ooh. and strong. And then in the when it gets a little bit warmer, we'll release them back into the marsh. Nice. So they might have names for them in the classrooms. We don't name them here. Sorry, I interrupted you when you were saying why you're raising all females. Yeah, so we're thinking we're replacing the females that uh, get hit by the car. So it's only the females that are coming up to lay their eggs. The males get to stay in the marshes. Okay. So they're really not getting hit by the cars as much as the females are. It's amazing that we have that kind of control that we can that we can force the the population of terrapins in one direction. So this is a program known as a Head Start program, where they're raising them up to a viable to to an age where they're less likely to to, they're they're more likely to survive in nature. Stockton University has a similar one uh, to this uh, with John Rakita in the Animal Lab. So this is pretty amazing. Oh, is there another one? Yep, they like to bury down there. Oh yeah. See that little guy down there? He's hiding pretty good. Oh. Okay. Rachel, Heather, (laughs) Alexandra. You okay. Remember this no. the next time you come here? <laughs> They're not going to be here the next time I come here. Beautiful. So those are our hashling turtles. They'll be in our Head Start program, so they're going to make their way over to a classroom. Well, they'll, they'll raise them up for us. And then nice. Them nice. What age group? What, uh, is there, are, if there's like any teachers watching, could they work with you guys to... They could definitely get in touch with... Uh, Brian is our uh, biologist that does the work with the terrapins. Like I said, I'm mostly a bird girl. I do help out with the terrapins, but he's kind of the man in charge with okay. all the terrapins. So, so there's opportunities. If you're not already in the program, there's opportunities there, for you to get involved. There may be. There may be. So I okay. would definitely reach out and see what the opportunities are. Okay. Um, I mean, of course, it all depends on how many you have and, yes. you know, what, the, what nature needs. But that's cool. Absolutely. So 
I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about birds because that's my specialty. Um, and while we're here in the lab, I can kind of show you a little bit about one of the birds I do work with. Oh, that's not a real one. That's a fake one. It kind of looks like a real one, Do you right? know that that's a fake one? <laughs> Are you a good enough bird biologist to know that I, you're holding a fake bird? I would hope so. Okay, yeah, I mean, I don't I know. So. I don't but know. it does fool the birds in the wild. Oh, okay. And that's why I have this guy, because um, we do trap the birds. Um, and the reason we trap them is uh, we put bands on them. Um, so the bands give us some information on movement, habitat use, survival, a bunch of different things. Where do you um, put the band? Around their neck? <laughs> so the band actually goes on their legs. Oh, it's like a bracelet. Yeah, it's like bracelet a bracelet for birds. For the birds. Um, and one of the ways we catch them, so the adults are very territorial. If you guys know anything about this, is the American oyster catcher, which is one of my favorite birds. It's actually what I did my uh, master's degree on, uh, was American oyster catcher nesting ecology. Um, these guys are very territorial. And you'll hear them out in the marshes making all kinds of racket, um, trying to defend their territories. So one way we trap the adults is we put these decoys down. And when we the adults um, come in and try to defend their territory and they um, get caught in our trap, and then we can put bands on them. Okay. So to show you the bands. So you're trying to, you're trying to get them angry. <laughs> you, Not you, trying to get them angry, but you, it is the best you, way to You're trying them. to get them angry. <laughs> in order to capture them and they're like and so you're essentially teaching them a lesson in anger management right there <laughs> we're teaching them to be very good at defending so show us these toys. bands so we put uh color are you bands a master bird them. bander i am not a master but i am a sub permit All so right. my supervisor lisa she's actually the master bander and I'm a sub-permit under her, so we all kind of work together to ban these birds. So in case you didn't know, there's like a whole apprenticeship system in bird banding. It's a national program. Actually, there's, it's a, there are international programs in bird banding because, of course, birds travel across the ocean. And so you have to register every single bird band, and you have to be very well trained that you won't hurt the birds. All right, so show us. So we put two different kinds of bird bands on oh, them. I'm not focused. There we go. So as Aaron was mentioning, um, we have to be permitted. These birds are protected under the Migratory Bird uh, Treaty Act. Uh, so we need special permits to be able to do this kind of stuff. So the first permit is um, just putting on the metal band. So this metal band identifies the bird, has a unique number on it, um, and that's the federal band. But you can't see this from a distance. I don't know if any of you can read that number. Probably not. Right? Yeah, it says 4A. There is a 4 in there. Oh, I got it wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, it's so once you, put the, once you put the band on there, is there like a website that you go to to register the band with a sp specific species? Yeah. So uh, okay. basically we have a program that once we band all these birds, we enter it into that system and it goes to a national database. Um, so anytime somebody sees one of these bands, they report it. It's called reportband.gov. Oh, okay. So if you see one, um, that's what you do. If you see a one, and you happen to find one, maybe it's dead. You know, maybe you find it, it's dead, and you want to report it. Yeah. yeah okay. So these ones you probably only find if the bird was dead or you're recapturing it. And that's why we put these bands on them. Okay. So these bands. Those again, you can see. If, but you can see it with binoculars. You can see it with binoculars. You can see it with a scope. And they have a unique number as well. Nice. And again, we do need permission to put these kind of bands on them as well. These are plastic color leg bands. And we put one of these numbers on uh, each of their upper legs. So this guy, let's say I want to put one on him, each of his legs would get C13. Okay. Okay, so if you're out on the marsh or on the beach and you see a flock of oyster catchers or one oyster catcher and you get your scope out and you can recite this, you can report it, and then they will send you back the information on when and where, and a little bit more about uh, that bird, where that bird was being. You know what? You should make rings out of those and like sell them to humans. We can ban humans. <laughs> so that's our oyster. It's like instead of voter registration. Oh, I love it! I love it. We're gonna. Oh, that's probably illegal. Okay. <laughs> so that's our oyster catcher. So we also do this with uh, black skimmers. And I do it with uh, great egrets as well here at the Institute. Wow, okay. How do you catch those? Do you, do you anger them too? Um, so the black skimmers, um, it's kind of opportunistic. So they roost in groups and we try to put the trap down where we think they're hanging out. So you need to know a lot about the bird's behavior and where it moves okay. and stuff like that. So it's they're not as easy tricky. as just putting out a decoy. Yeah, you uh, can catch them on a nest, but these guys are solitary nesters. So these guys defend their territory. Black skimmers, they nest in colonies. So there's a big group of them all nesting together. It helps with protection from predators. 
Um, and since they're in those big colonies, we try not to go in there in the middle of the nesting season because mm, okay. it disturbs them all. Yeah. Um, so okay. we really don't catch them as much on the nest unless there's some that are kind of on the outskirts or there's an easier way to get to them. I see. So we mostly catch them um, when they're roosting groups away from the nesting areas. Cool. We also catch chicks. So the chicks we catch just before they're Little flying. baby ones? Not quite little babies, but right before they get the feathers to fly. We talked about fledge earlier, so right before they fledge. Um, we can catch them. Okay. Okay, and then we put the bands on them, and then when they fly, we can recite them, uh, kind of like we do with the adults. All right, all right. Uh, the great egrets. Does are... it bother them at all? These bands? Does it, does it bother them? Nope. There's been a lot of research, and we've perfected ways to have um, these different schemes that work for each species. So, for example, the oyster catcher is a very long-legged bird. Okay. Um, so we put the plastic band above the joint. Okay. 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 Um, the black skimmer, he's got. Basically, no upper leg to him. He's got a little little tarsus, is what it's called, this little bone down here. Mm -hmm. So we'll band on that. So the skimmer will be a little bit different. Where these guys, we band the metal band on the bottom, and then the plastic bands on both of the upper legs. Okay. The skimmer, we have one leg, one bottom leg that has a metal, and then the other leg gets a color band. It's probably a source of pride for them. They're like, look at this cool jewelry I got. <laughs> and the egrets are a little bit different. So the egrets we catch on the nest. Okay. Um, and the egrets, all of the bands go on the upper. So okay. we have one metal on the upper and one color. On so the there other. you go, guys. You, that's where you want to look for the bands. If you, if you go out bird watching and you see one, you can report it. What's the website? It is reportband.gov. Reportband.gov. Oh, it's a government that's website. That's right. And there'll be yeah. options on there. If you happen to get the metal band, awesome. If not, there's an option on there just to put the color band in. And you'll get a certificate. With all the band information, you can keep that certificate. And you get good karma. You get good, you get good karma. You get, yeah, yeah, you get You'll good see me karma. do a little dance in my office, so I'm oh, so excited what's to the get dance? data. What's the dance? It's, Show it's a secret dance. Oh, <laughs> come on. All right. So let's go, let's go see some cool, let's go see some stuff. You want to go see some stuff? Yeah, of course. All right. go see let's some stuff. Let's move over to the aquarium and we can show you some really cool stuff She won't stuff do the there. dance for us. I won't do the so, dance. Somebody said when I said uh, the, in, the, in the monarch chrysalis, there's a brain floating around in there, but they can't find it. She's like, that sounds like some humans I know. <laughs> that is hilarious. I like it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Oh, sorry, guys. It's very loud. All right. So we're back in the tide pool. We're heading out to our terrapin station. Nice. You guys want to go back and learn some more about terrapins? I mean, I do. All right. Don't worry, guys. We'll go out in the trail in a little bit. All right. So this is our terrapin station. Um, a lot of you that have been here have seen this. Um, Again, we do have a virtual terrapin station, so you can learn more about all of this stuff by going on the website. So I'm not going to talk about it too much here, okay. but I do have a very special guest for you guys to meet. <gasps> oh, and look, somebody brought me something to feed to the terrapin. Oh, oh man, we got a little okay. sibling. Okay. So this here is Pablo. That's his name. Escobar? <laughs> See the drug smuggling? Know. He doesn't have a last name. He's just Pablo. That's all Does I Does he need smuggle to drugs? No, oh, okay, he's cool. a good terrapin. Pablo. He by the rules. Hi, Pablo. So that is Pablo. So Pablo is a male. So ter terrapins are what's called sexually dimorphic. And what sexually dimorphic means is the males look different than the females. So the males are much smaller than the females. So, so this, this is a full-grown male? This is a full-grown male. Oh, man. We think Look, he's... I don't have the food. I have a camera. Go to her. She's the one with the food. <laughs> so these guys have for you so you can see a little closer. These guys have big crushing jaws. Oh, or is that the lipstick? He's, he's not really cooperating for you right now, but <laughs> <I'll see if laughs> he I does can. have crushing lips. I'll see if I can. Oh, uh, there you go. Hi, Pablo. <laughs> That's Pablo. Arr, 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 arr. So those are made to crush some of the marine invertebrates. So they do eat mussels and crabs and clams and all kinds of stuff like that. So those jaw um, that jaw does help them with that. You can see this guy's uh, feet. Oh, um, so, oh, oh. as I mentioned oh, before, okay. these guys are adapted for life in uh, the salt marshes. Um, so, unlike sea turtles, so sea turtles have flippers, right? Mm -hmm. To swim around. These guys don't have flippers, but they have webbed feet. Nice. See that there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see how this guy got his name. So, diamondback terrapin, they have the, that really cool diamond pattern. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me how he got his name Pablo. Oh, I'm not sure oh, okay. how he got the name Pablo. We have all kinds of crazy well, names. That doesn't make guys. any sense. <laughs> and 
even though um, all of them have kind of that diamond pattern, all of them are different in coloration um, and different patterns that they have here. So this guy is actually kind of a unique color. He's a gray morph, um, which me means he's a little bit lighter than a lot of the other terrapins that are out there. So let me go. Yep. Let so me go and give me the crab. She left me a really special treat. So does anybody know what this guy is here? That is a fiddler crab. And that he is plays actually, the fiddle. Well, it does. That's how he got his name, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because he's got a big old <laughs> arm to play the so fiddle. So this is a male. So the male uses that um, that big old claw and waves it around. And the female picks him hey. by how nice his, his claw is and how he dances. Yeah, that's a pretty nice claw he's got there. All right. You guys want to see me feed him to Pablo? I mean, I don't want to see him die, but okay. All right, circle of life, here you go. There you go, Pablo. This is another reason these diamondbacks are really important because they eat all of these crabs, but they also make room for new crabs. Pablo, Pablo, he's underneath of you. Pablo. He's not paying attention to the, Pablo is all about the, the attention right, all right now. All right, Pablo. He's biting, Pablo, you're, you're stupid. Oh, he's looking, oh, uh, okay, he's okay. Oh, there we go, there we go, oh. We didn't name the crab. Oh, that, fit. that was your claw, Pablo. You're biting your own claw. Oh, well, he just got... <laughs> That's a pretty wily little crab. He's hiding right behind him. <laughs> oh, okay, him. I think we got him. We got him. Yeah, we got him. Bye-bye, crab. Good job, Pablo. <laughs> Awesome. So we have Good here. Good job. In the tank. You perform basic living functions. <laughs> we have here in the tank. This is a female, so you can't. Oh, okay. Can maybe see to my hand how big she is. Oh yeah, yeah. Her name is Lovey. Lovey. She loves the attention. <laughs> we can maybe get a view from the top of her, but she, she's really pretty, isn't she? So like I said before, she's they all gorgeous. come in different colors. You can see how her patterns and colors are very different than Pablo's. She's beautiful. Right. So it's gonna be a little noisy as we walk back. You can just scan around this area. One, uh, one thing we have back here, we have an area to hatch out horseshoe crab eggs. Horseshoe crab. So we put the horseshoe crab eggs in here, and then when they hatch out, we put them in the little tanks over here. They're so tiny. Oh, and look at that. She has some eggs set aside for us to look at. That was really nice. Oh, those aren't horseshoe crab. Oh, yes, they are. Yes, yeah, they, they are. are yeah. Oh, they're so tiny. Oh, they got little tiny shells. Oh, you guys can't see them. Tiny. Ma, mommy, mommy Muller. Oh, that's your name. Do all young diamondback terrapins have freckles like little Pablo and Lovey? Not necessarily. Like I said, they all kind of come in different colors. A lot of them do have a lot of spots on them. Okay. Um, they all got personalities. They do have personalities. All, you know, if you don't think, if you, you have personalities, all humans, oh, so do animals. We just, we just never really studied it. But all animals have personalities too. So we got a horseshoe crab in here. This is a baby. He actually just oh, molded. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me not drop you my camera kind of in the water. It. You can probably see a little bit better over from this side where there it's it is. not as ripply. But that's a baby horseshoe crab that just molted. Cool. And we're about to show you an adult horseshoe crab. The Wetlands Institute just told mommy that she had a great question. <laughs> Who's Good. who is signed on? Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably our education staff. They're, Got it. <laughs> they're really good. All right, we're going to move through the aquarium area, so it's going to be noisy for a second until we get to the back area. Oh, okay. Close the door. Okay. Close this. The door. The door. Yeah. Oh, it's like the touch tank from, from Finding Nemo 2. Yes. Don't touch them. They don't want to be touched. <laughs> they don't like it. Okay. Oh, I guess I'll go over here. Okay. What do we got? All right. So we got a bunch of really cool stuff in here. And actually, it took me a while earlier to find our flounder. There is a flounder hidden in here. That's very small. We'll see if Aaron can find him while I'm talking to you guys. A oh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge okay. for him. All you usually see are just the eyes poking up. That's all you get. And oh, he's pretty man. small. He's probably about that big. All right. Well, show us what else we got right. while I'm looking. So one thing I wanted to point out to you guys, as I mentioned before, I mostly work with birds, but I also help out with terrapins, and I also help out with this guy right here. Oh, man. Just introduce them. 
This is the horseshoe crab. This is an He's adult horseshoe crab. He's sticking his finger out at us. <laughs> That's his tail, guys. This is the adult horseshoe crab. Um, He's got barnacles growing on him. He does have barnacles growing on him. He's um, got to clean himself. <laughs> okay, tell so, us a little bit about this guy. This guy right here is pretty neat. Um, he's actually more closely related to a spider than a crab, and I'll show you why. Wah! Pretty crazy, right? Yo, so, that's nasty. So a couple areas it's like a to bug. point out on him. That area in the middle, where I'm pointing right now, that's actually his mouth. Wait, wait. Right what? There, where he keeps pointing. Mm -hmm. Ew, that's gross. Now, I keep calling it a him. How do I know it's a him? I mean, I don't know. Did you look at his private parts? I did not. Mm. I can tell by his claws. Okay, show us. Okay, so these front claws right here, if they look like the rest of his claws, see how the rest of his claws, he has all these little pinchers? Yeah. Okay, if it looks like the rest of them, maybe it would be a female. Okay. But you see how he's got these, they look like boxer gloves, don't they? Little boxer gloves on his very front claw. Are they used to hold on to her? Yes, they are. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That so makes sense. So during the nesting season or when the females come up, these guys hold on to them, uh, hoping that they'll be able to secure that female as their own. And they help bring them up when they're laying the eggs. And, uh, you guys want to know what the technical term is for those, for those boxing gloves? I bet you don't know. They're called gonathopods, except with a silent G. <laughs> Good. gonathopods. Good job. Another part to point out on these guys, these are his gills. They're called book gills. They kind of look like pages in a book when you see them flapping. Okay. Okay. And what about this thing right here? A lot of people are afraid of this That's thing. That's the thing that killed Steve Irwin. Right? Wait. It looks scary. It looks like you could hurt yourself, right? Don't but die. Do you think I'm going to hurt myself? I don't know. No. Okay. It's actually not that sharp at all. So this is actually used to help flip him over. Oh, okay. So when these guys do come up to the surface, they get pushed around by the waves and often get flipped over, and this helps them right themselves when they come oh, up. Oh, cool. Yeah, nice adaptation. Right. So it's not, to, it's not to kill anything. What do these guys it's eat? Not. These guys eat a lot of the um, same invertebrates that some of these other species So do. like they crabs? Eat Clams, they might eat crabs, yeah. Cool. All kinds of stuff like that. You'll see mussels in Barbara there. corrected me. I meant, he, I meant Finding Dory, not Finding Nemo, guys. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. And I'm if sorry. you like Finding Dory, stay tuned, because I'm going to introduce you to somebody really special Sweet. from Finding Dory. Sweet. All right, so did we find that flounder? No, but I do see a, a, a what do you call it, um, starfish. You found a starfish? Yeah, I found a starfish. It took me a while earlier to find There's starfishes, right? Those flounder there, are guys. really, really good at hiding in here. What was the snail or the, the was that a hermit crab that was crawling around? Yes. Yeah, so oh man, and you got another crab. You got one of the mud, is that a mud crab? Is that this what they're called? This is a spider crab. Spider crab. Yeah. Look at that. We also have urchin. You can't really see around the bubbles. There's an urchin there. Oh yeah, look we at that. We also have a sea star over here. Oh, that's what I just called the starfish. Yeah. Yeah, is there a difference, between a, is there a difference between a sea star and a starfish? Well, actually, starfish is not the right term for it because they aren't actually fish. Wow. That, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you know, seahorses aren't actually horses. That's right. That's right. I don't know. Do you know where it is? I can't find it. I, I haven't seen him, so I guess he's going to be hidden until you guys can come here and, oh, and look for him yourself. Crab. Oh, you got that little dog still crawling around. Look at him. Can I pick him up? Yeah. Come here. Though. Yeah, you know how you get them to come on out? How's that? You breathe on them. Let's see. Oh, oh, he went back in. Yeah, you can get them to come on. Hey, oh, no. So you get them to come on out when you when you exhale. They don't like the carbon dioxide. All right, I'll put you back. I'll put you back. Relax. All right. So that flounder's gonna hide on us. Yeah. Maybe when you guys come to visit us at the institute, you'll be able to find him. It's like a trick. I don't see him. <laughs> But I did. I thought, you, I thought you knew where he was and you were just challenging me. You I, were actually asking me to find him. Well, I did find him earlier, but he might have moved since that. Oh, you know what? I see him. You see him? I do. All right. All right. So his eyeballs are sticking up right there. You guys want to see him move? Yeah. Those are his eyeballs. Wah! There he goes. Look at him. He's going. <laughs> so why do they have eyeballs on the top of their head and not on either side like most fish? Well, because he lives at the bottom.
bottom of the of the water. You can see he lives right in the sand here, so he doesn't need his eyeballs on the bottom or they'd be dragging along. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, there's no point to having an eyeball on the bottom <laughs> if you're laying like that. All right, so you guys want to meet one of my favorite creatures here at the Institute? I don't know. Is one of your favorite creatures a spider? Because then no. It is not. Okay, cool. But he does have a lot of legs. All right, that all right. That gives you a hint. All right. Is it a lobster? So if you guys like finding Dory, which my nephew does, my nephew actually suggested that we name this guy Hank. Wow. And there's Hank. Wait, do we have two Hanks? Wait, I thought, oh, that's right, that's right, though, so this is a Hank. This is Hank. Hank is our octopus. Squishy. And so I, my nephew and I said name we should name him squishy. Hank. Squishy. When we first got him, and I suggested it to the research team, and they put it out to the public, and everybody loved the name Hank. I so like Hank. Hank is good. Must be a very popular. Are there slinkies back there? He's got all kinds of toys and enrichment. Oh, look what she's putting in the tank for him. Oh, man. Get to see Hank eat a fish. Does Hank know how to unscrew a jar? It looks like it, doesn't it? Let's see what happens. Ow. What? This is crazy. Hank, Hank, you gotta, you gotta, Hank, you gotta let her help. Is he gonna get it? Pretty smart creatures, these guys. I think he can do it. What do you guys think? I don't know. Taking his time. <laughs> that poor fish. That poor fish is like... It's like the, the kraken, or what's that creature from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean that engulfs the ship? It's the kraken. The kraken. Come on, Hank. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> Hank can't figure it out. Well, we can show you some of the critters and come back to him. And all right, all right, all right. Think? Look at all those suckers. Pretty. All right, Hank. Hank is definitely my favorite. He's We're a really cool critter, you. but we have a lot of really cool critters in here. We have mantis shrimp down here. Neat. Wait, are these the ones that like snap really, really fast? Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So look, after this live stream, or you know, right now, if you want to, you can go on YouTube and you can look up mantis shrimp and and the fastest movement in the animal kingdom. They make something that's so supersonic, they snap really fast, and it's not to catch anything, it's to deter predators, or to deter, uh, yeah, to deter other predators. All right, what else? All right, so we got some crabs down here, we got some more sea stars up above you. You're ugly. What, what, oh, look there at him. There he is, right in the front. That's his stomach. We're looking into his innards. Yeah. All right. <laughs> And then we also have uh, toadfish. Up above Mur you, we have Mur a fish Mur called sheep's head. Hi, sheep's head. Not really sure. This guy must be a new. Oh, the sea robin. He's a new guy. I don't know if I've even. Look seen at that him gigantic yet. fin. Does he have another one? Yeah, he does. Yeah, oh, look at that. Neat. Oh, they can't see it because I'm a I'm an awful videographer. Look You're just so excited to see it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 half the reason I do these is because I just want to see stuff. Puff our fish! Yep, we got our puff up, bur puff, our up. Bur fish. puff up, puff up, puff up. Nope, he's not doing it. All right. <laughs> What's his name? What? He is called a striped burfish. Oh, a burfish. So he's not a puffer fish. More affectionately, people know them as puffer fish. Oh, so they're not actually called puffer fish. They're called striped, <laughs> striped burfish. Bur And there's another one back behind I you. name you Squishy. Okay, what? <laughs> All right, should we see if Hank got that? Hank, you best not disappoint. Man, he is gorgeous. Well, he hasn't quite got it yet. We can come back here at the end and say, yeah. wait, wait, he's... Is he unscrewing it? Let's see. Hank, come on. He's working on it. This is a challenge for him. <laughs> Maybe he's just sleeping. Maybe it's like it's his best toy or something. <laughs> He does like to show up his toys. He is a very... They're very intelligent. Yeah, They're yeah. very intelligent. He is a lot of fun to watch if you guys ever come here. But we can walk you through the exhibit a little bit more. Yeah. Um, this right here, we don't have any live birds, unfortunately, in our exhibit. But this is a willet. And hopefully we'll see some live ones out in the marsh. But this gives I you a good up-close view of what a willet is. 
Willie the Willet. And they okay. are one of the birds And they that eat snails? They do eat snails. And crabs? And they are one of the few birds that say, actually there's quite a few that say their names. So when you hear them in the marsh, you might hear, Will, Will, Will it? And that's him saying his name. That's an awful impression. I know. You want to try it? No. <laughs> I mean, you didn't want to dance. <laughs> didn't want to dance. Just a bunch of shells. That's an, oh, we got, well, no, we got some stuff in here. We got we got mussels and we got we got quo, quo, quo hogs, quo hogs. Quo hogs. Yeah. All right. Cool. So this is our station. Hank, um, you best get cracking. We also have shells over here and a little exhibit on horseshoe crabs. This is kind of what it looks like. Now, are um, you guys open for um, if uh, if like a school wants to take a school bus here? Do you guys do tours? Um, we do. You'd have to get in touch with the education department. Okay. Okay. Do. Okay. So go to the yeah. website. Go to right the website. now, it's a lot of homeschool groups and that kind of thing. Cool. But, um, okay. So you take homeschool groups. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. Excellent. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. You guys want to head outside no. and see our grounds a little bit more? No, I'm afraid of the outside. You're All right. Let's go. Well, let's go. Okay. All right. Let's see what's going on out here. We're back in the marsh. Let's see if we can find special somebody who's keeping a lookout for me for some critters of the gardens at the moment. All right, guys, now I have to tell you, we don't have a, a strongest 4G signal. So if we lose the connection, hang tight. We'll be right back, okay? Hello. Hello, hello. Who are you? I am Devin Griffiths. I am the resident marketing Oh, um, I need you to if, uh, oh. share the mic. Yeah. Sorry. That's you can just like hold it next to him. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm Devin Griffiths. I do marketing and communications here at the Institute, and I am also one of the resident bird nerds. Bird nerds? Yes, yes. Uh, Is that your official title? I, I'm trying to make it that, but they haven't gone for it quite yet. <laughs> All right. So. That's what you'll be to me, bird yeah. nerd. Yes. Yeah, well, un unofficially I am. Do you have a fish head too? I do not have a fish head. Oh yeah, well, those, are the, those are the people that study fish. Fish heads yeah. and bird nerds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what we're looking at right here... Are cars. Are cars parked right outside of part of what is called Marion's Gardens. These are native plantings that were put in here by Marion Glassby many, many, many years ago. And she was very concerned about native flora and native fauna. So native plants, native animals. and. The gardens here, because they're native, they support a, a wide variety of insects, monarch butterflies among them. Those insects support a wide variety of migratory birds. And so what you're having now, this time of year, fall migration is really underway. And because we have these wonderful native gardens here, you can get in this little patch of plants and trees here, a dozen, maybe more, dozen and a half species of migratory birds just in this one little section. Nice. So and just as soon as people roll up, they can see stuff. Essentially, they right from the parking lot. You don't even have to get out of your car. Yeah, look, there's the marsh. It's right there. All right. So you can hand, if you want to just give them the mic, um, if that's easier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. The drop-off is, is quick, but not that quick. So you can still talk if it's just loud. Okay. So if you wanted to take a look at the marsh out here so i'm sure that sam has mentioned the salt pans as being one of the primary features of the marsh out a here. salt pan the salt pan. is that a we pan with salt about, ah. we've talked about the marsh a little bit from the tower but we haven't seen things up close and personal so we said we might get around to some of the beautiful white birds that are over there so this is a salt pan that is a salt why pan. is it called a salt pan uh salt because it's brackish water so it's not fresh water and pan I suppose flat. because it is flat and looks yeah. a little bit like a pan. It's really shallow. Um, <laughs> it's really shallow. shallow. It's really mucky. It smells awful. <laughs> and the reason it smells awful is because it has methane coming out of it. And look, I got, a, I got an activity for you guys to do at home. All right. Actually, I can't, can't describe it to you entirely, but just look up, look up swamp gas fires. All right. And then you have to get a funnel and a tube and a lighter. And I promise you, You'll have fun. Just make sure you don't singe your eyebrows off. <laughs> I've done it. I've done it with the, the eyebrows thing with you my classes. Some experience. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, I teach ecology, so I gotta, I gotta show the students. Actually, we should head over to the gardens for a second because right, we have a couple of people that are in the process of tagging monarchs right now. Well, we're walking. Why don't you put that lapel on? Just, just clip it. It's a yeah, it's like a lapel microphone. 
We're tagging monarchs? We are tagging monarchs. Like with bands? Like with the bird bands? Well, not exactly. Bird bands would be too heavy for a monarch. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. But, uh, well, this is Margaret over here, and I will let Margaret describe how oh. exactly she and her husband Joe you know, are going about the no. tagging these. Wait, what's this? What's this? What's this? So this is a turtle excluder, and this is designed to protect the nests and eventually the hatchlings of the diamondback terrapins. Okay. So if we're fortunate enough to find a nesting diamondback terrapin on the property, we'll let her lay her eggs, let her cover up the nest. Once we know where the nest is, we'll put this excluder over it so that the eggs are protected from predators. Where are you guys? And eventually, when Still the hatchlings eggs. come out, they will be protected. And when we see them, we'll take the excluder off and let them go on their way into the marsh. Nice. All right, Margaret, here we come. All right. Yeah, we're coming over. You just got to, oh, somebody's got to hold the mic next to you. Otherwise, you're not going to be here. Hi. How are you? My name's Margaret. I love your mask. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's perfect. I blend in with the monarchs. <laughs> are you are you a volunteer or do you work here? I'm a volunteer. Okay. And what do you want to know? So actually, uh, Aaron had asked a question: Do we band monarchs the same way we band birds? Uh, no, we actually tag them with a little tiny tag. It's a sticker. They get a sticker. They get a sticker. It's like their passport to get to Mexico. And if you find that sticker, this monarch on the way anywhere along the route or in Mexico. Okay, but not right now because there's, there's a COVID pandemic, so they can't go across the border. <laughs> there's a, 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 a website you can go to I can't focus for monarchwatch.org for the University of um, Kansas. Okay, and so if you find a monarch with this sticker. Sticker, you should take a picture. Okay, so we got the website, which is band. Reportband.gov for birds, and then what? What is this it? This is this is. Um, does it say oh the website God. on there? Yes, it does. It says oh, okay. um, mwatchtag.org, M or watch you can go into Monarch org. Watch um, or uh, University of Kansas, and um, because they all work together. Okay. And you can re you can report that you found this guy in your location. Cool. And then say like I tagged him here, and if somebody sees him down in South Carolina or Alabama, then we know that he's traveled how far he's traveled. How do they make it that entire way? I don't know, but while we're tagging them, we also do things like assess the um, whether they're male or female. Okay. We look at the quality of the wings. Um, you can tell if it's male or female by opening up its wings. Now, you're being real gentle, guys. If you don't know how to hold a monarch butterfly, don't do it on your own. She's being really gentle. Yeah, you can see. And she's just making it look easy. these two tags, right? Uh, these two um, dots right there. Okay. A female does not have them, and a female has whiter veins um, in her wings. Um, you can also see on a male monarch that little dot bleeds through. Can you okay, see it? Okay, okay, okay. See how it kind of bleeds yeah, through? Yeah, I can bit? say it's not so easy. But you're better off. My camera doesn't it up. focus the best, which is a problem. We measure the wings. Um, we measure one wing. We measure from the. Um, there's a little dot. There's a little dot right here where the uh, thorax and the wing meet. Okay. A little tiny dot. So you're going to measure it from there to the tip there of the wing. to the apex of the wing. All right. So is this guy ready to let be let go at some point? Oh, yeah. He's all tagged right now. Oh, he's now. all tagged. Then after we assess, then we look at how well he's eating, his little belly. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's getting excited. Don't he likes squ me. squ No. Boyfriend. He's like, that. that's <laughs> weird. Stop doing that. Right. So we, and we can tell from that, we record all this data. You can, um, we kind of trace their, how well they're feeding from next Science. resources along the way. Um, and then uh, we take off a couple of scales, maybe, and put this little tiny sticker on them. That doesn't hurt them when you take off the scales, does it? No, they have they're, they're tough wings. Okay, okay. It's just like a, almost like a um, dragonfly's wings under there. All right, that all right, chicken. all right. Just don't take a chunk out like a bird does. You want to let them go? Absolutely. You're going to make a peace sign. Put, put, them, put them on your nose. Yeah, guys, so that's the correct way of handling a butterfly in nature. You don't want to hold them otherwise because that stretches out his wings. You hold him with the two fingers like that, if anything, all right? And then you have to say, hasta la vista. All right, hasta la vista. And let him go. Oh, <laughs> I lost him already. He's right there. He's heading south. He's Beautiful. out of here. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for volunteering and doing that. No problem. Do you guys take other volunteers if they want to if they want to help out? Like, can they work with you? With the Monarch Monitoring Project? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's several of us who do this tag. Excellent.
and uh, it's a lot of fun. I've been doing it for three years now, and I absolutely love it. It's my favorite part of the season. Cool. I have a pollinator garden, and I'm a monarch way station at my house, a registered way station. Um, so I kind of a way know, station is a stopover point from Mexico. Right, right, where they can get food, and there's milkweed. I have a lot of different kinds of milkweed, like six different varieties of milkweed that I grow at my property. Yeah. And um, so I have caterpillars and monarchs all summer long. But this is my favorite part of the season when they're actually like moving through. And sometimes it's just so thrilling out here. Now, are you wearing the mask because you want to you want to attract them? <laughs> are you like, trying to be a monarch butterfly? I am. I, am. <laughs> I can sneak up on them easier. <laughs> that explains why I'm never good at catching butterflies because I don't look like one, and I certainly don't smell like one. All right, let's go. Let's go to the march. Thank you so much, Margaret. Guys, thank you all for tuning in. And again, ask away. I am super happy to have anybody ask questions. No question is too silly. No question is stupid. Ask away. One thing I do want to point out while we're here is the goldenrod. So we're, while we're talking about the monarch butterflies, this goldenrod, which is those yellow flowers there, uh, the butterflies love those. Yeah, so if you want a pollinator garden at home, you're talking milkweed, goldenrod, butterfly bushes, all kinds of stuff. You need stuff that they can grab, that they can grab nectar from. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. All right. So let's try to get closer to the salt pan and see uh, what bird species we can see. I'm dying to see some more birds. I want to know if Hank got the fish yet. So Devin's pointing out that he sees an Eastern Phoebe. One Eastern of our... Phoebe? Oh, there she goes. She's flying in the trees over there. She's actually sitting up. One of their characteristics oh. is they pump their tail when they sit. She's on that, that little right guy on the little the tree. branch. The one on the branch is actually... There's a sparrow over there. They can't yeah. see it. They can't uh, see it. They can't see it. Well, it's we're going right. to go look at some big birds that I know you guys can see at home and you probably are very familiar if you've the ever been one? to the marsh. What species is Big Bird? Big Bird? I'm not sure if he's... That is still a matter of <laughs> species unknown to science. Sesame Streetus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so while we're walking the trails here, I'm going to stop right here real quick, Aaron, and kind of point out something that Devin spent a lot of time on and they look fabulous are our um, vegetation signs along the trails. Nice. Um, and they teach us a little bit about what species we have here. Um, this one's pointing out our eastern prickly pear. So on the ground here are prickly pear. Don't touch them. They're sharp. There's no <laughs> fruit. Where's the? Oh, there's a fruit. I see a fruit. See the fruit right there? Yeah. It's starting to grow. It's not ready yet. So that's and they our... said we don't have cacti in Jersey. Um, I mean, nobody what, said that. I said that. One cool thing about the prickly pear is they have a natural antifreeze and it helps them survive the freezing temperatures in the winter. So well, now, guys, see, that's something I actually did not know. You did not? Oh, no, you just cool. taught me something. Cool. And as we're walking around, you'll see these exclosures uh, for the terrapins. So I think this year we got close to 60 exclosures up along our property, as you can see. And uh, here's what was... everybody's been waiting for, is a nice scenic trail. Yeah. All right. And you guys really do maintain this. It is wonderful. How many, how many, like, do you have, like, a mile of trail that people can walk, or? Uh, it's mostly just this one trail that okay. goes down. I think it's maybe, like, a quarter, quarter mile. mile. Okay, okay, so it's great for bird watching. Yeah. You know, maybe not right now, but next season when we're not worried about social distancing and everything, you can take a lawn chair out here and just observe for a little bit. Absolutely. So I do see a couple birds in our marshes that hopefully we can, once we walk this platform, I can get a little bit closer and talk about them. I see a heron. We really haven't e talked about them too Oh, no, much. that's an egret, yeah? That the white one? That is an egret. So those are great egrets. Okay. And we'll, we'll introduce them a little bit more. They have a lot of uh, cool stuff with them. They're actually one of the birds that I am studying here. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. We can get a little closer to them. Oh, and we got, we got another wading bird species. So all these long-legged species. Oh, we can see one right through the trees there is. Oh, I see them. Oh, I see him. A little blue. So this guy, a little blue? he's white. Oh, I thought you said he was blue. Yeah, so one tricky thing about the little blue is that when they're juveniles, they're actually white. Right so he looks very there. similar to 
the snowy egret. Okay. So the snowy egret is close to that size, but they have um, a black bill with these yellow feet. And this guy has got a little bit different coloration in his bill. Did he get fish? He got fish. He, he got a fish. Feet. So this is a juvenile little blue egret. Wow. Cool. I think so, you got an osprey in your nest back there. Is that an osprey? Uh, I think it's a gull. Oh. Trying, he wants to be an osprey, though. Okay, well. A gull that aspires to be can, an osprey. He can aspire. So, um. Devin, can you bird... walk? Can you, can you stalk a fish like, like a heron? <laughs> Come on, yeah. you can do it. Come on, you can do really it. I'm really not good at it. Uh, Although, if I could go back and get my hip waders, then maybe I would. Guys, if I, wasn't, if I wasn't tethered to a camera, you know I'd do it. <laughs> there might be video of me doing that anyway. <laughs> So the wading bird species, um, a lot of them in this state are species of concern. Okay. Uh, they are declining. A lot of the populations are declining um, and their nesting areas are diminishing a bit. Um, a lot of that has to do with, again, development, but also increased um, marsh subsidence. So the marsh is sinking a little bit okay. and the sea levels are rising. Why, okay. why is that happening? Why is marsh sinking? Uh, well, as we have these increased flooding and as we get sea level rise, um, the marsh just starts to go farther and farther oh, underneath yeah. the water. All right. Um, so it's degrading their habitats and these birds don't have as many areas to nest. Right. They just have the coast. That's prime real estate. Yeah. So we're very fortunate here at the Wetlands Institute because we have an area just in the north of here. You might have been able to see it from the tower, but it's a little bit far off um, where over a quarter of the state's nesting wading bird species are nesting. Okay. So over a quarter. Over a quarter. Jeez. Yep. The state does aerial surveys to um, get population estimates and nesting, figure out nesting areas for the species. Uh, and we went from about 43 colonies in 1995, and then in 2018 we we're down to 31. Okay. So that kind of shows you how much uh, it's kind of diminishing through the years. So we need to figure out a way to um, preserve those habitats and enhance them for these species. I don't know where I'm walking. I, I we just, are going I just, out here. <laughs> I don't know if I'm leading or if you're leading. <laughs> these are great egrets out here. You might or might not be able they to see them. They can see them. them. The They're little white dots, but they, they can see dots. them. And if you guys look out near marshes, one way to identify these guys, they're one of the biggest wading bird species we have here besides the um, great blue heron. Um, they're big white birds with yellow bills, and they're one of the species I banned as well. So That's Devin. That's while not you're a bird. out there, <laughs> while you're out there, make sure you're keeping track of if they have bands as well. They can be sometimes really hard to see in this hard in this high grass, um, but these guys have yellow bands that okay. I'm using. Okay. So they can stand out if you can see their legs. Um, and like I said, we are working right now um, with. Uh, the Seven Mile Innovation Laboratory. So it's Smile. A, smile. Yep, it's called Smile. Um, and it's a bunch of people all working together to figure out ways to use, while we're out there dredging these channels to make them deeper, using that material and placing it back on the marsh. Um, so creating habitat for these species. So again, they're running out of areas to nest. Those areas are starting to kind of degrade. Um, so we're figuring out ways to work with these dredging operations to put it back on the marsh uh, to create some habitat for these birds. So that's part of what I'm doing out there is I'm getting out there and I'm looking at their nest success and figuring out what habitats do they like, how are they doing, and what do they need. Okay. So this is where you go down to the marsh with some waders. Yep. Go it down is, to the uh, marsh. It is still uh, kind of soggy down there, so yeah. I wouldn't go down there unless no, you have boots no, on. No, 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 no. I don't have my boots on right That's now. That's all right. I'll but take one thing you can see over there, there, so I mentioned that one of the areas uh, we work for research here is uh, wetlands monitoring. So you see all those stakes? You can probably see those. Or at least you can see that big pole that's kind of sticking up over there. Um, that's actually a well, so that helps us keep track of the water levels. Okay. So we're tracking that. So you're not pumping water out. We you're are not pumping no, water okay. out. We really just track um, the ground level and the, the water level in there, see how that changes over time and within seasons. Um, and the other way we do that is all these little pipes we have down here, that is actually a um, elevation um, gauge. So it helps us figure out how much is the marsh 
um, grow, getting larger or is, how much is it subsiding? Cool. Um, like we talked about before. So kind of helps us track how that's changing over time as well. I think he sees a fish. Yeah, they get very quiet and sneaky. You gotta be real sneaky, right? You gotta be real sneaky, you gotta be quiet. I don't know why we're whispering, they can't hear us. <laughs> All right. That's cool. So, I mean, you guys are really, you got your thumb on the pulse of these wetlands. Now, why are migratory birds important to study? Again, kind of similar to what we talked about with the osprey. Um, they are, again, part of the food chain. Um, one thing we didn't mention is that these birds were almost wiped out in the late 1800s. So, some of you might have heard of the feather trade. So, these birds have big, beautiful plumes, big, beautiful feathers. And that was a big fashion statement back in that time. And um, these guys are almost decimated. They're almost wiped out because people were using those plumes. So they were taking the birds for those plumes um, before these birds were protected. And luckily by the 1900s, we developed some protection for them and they started rebounding. And no, now they're experiencing No more fancy other feather dresses. <laughs> no yeah. more fancy feather dresses. You really don't see people walking around with the big plumes in there. But uh, the great egret is actually a symbol of the National Audubon Society as well because of that. Cool. It's actually important to note that the protection that these birds received came from not government officials, not scientists, not just everyday people. There were two people, very concerned citizens in Massachusetts, that founded the Massachusetts Audubon Society in order to protect these egrets. Uh, several other state Audubon societies happened after that. This was 1898. In 1905, the movement grew to the National Audubon Society, and in 1910, these birds were protected. So all those protections that we're talking about were started by just normal people who cared about the birds. Mm. So it doesn't take a PhD scientist or a government official or anyone in any position of power or influence. It just takes someone who's passionate about conservation. Okay. So I think it's kind of important to, to make But don't sure. go out trying to capture them on your own self to protect them. No, you gotta know what you're not. doing. I mean, yeah, okay, so individuals can do stuff by themselves and, and they're, they're powerful on their own, but yeah, don't, but don't, catching the birds. Yeah, don't go catching the birds. So, guys, another reason why migratory birds are really important to study, you think about it, if a bird migrates from Mexico up here, they're literally taking chunks of Mexico in their bellies up to here, and then when they leave, they're taking chunks of the United States down to Mexico, all right? They are literally moving continents back and forth, all right? And so, I mean, if we don't study migratory birds, if we don't protect them, we lose all of the cross-continental relationships that are so important. Look at all those little tiny fish. Yeah, I probably can't see them on the camera. You gotta go but... from science to being, ew. <laughs> He's dead. He is dead. Poor guy, he didn't make it. But we do something called return the favor. Um, that's another one of our programs. Where, and that's another area you guys can get involved in. Um, we basically go to uh, the Delaware Bay where most of these horseshoe crabs are coming up to nest. Okay. And we talked about that little, uh, what's called the telson, that little uh, look like a tail coming off on that horseshoe crab, right? Yeah. Um, well, when Just they let me know up, if I'm about to go over the railing, okay? Um, <laughs> Thanks. There is a little bit of a turn coming up. But uh, when they come up, I mentioned before that the wave energy sometimes knocks them over. Right. And if they're not able to right themselves before the tide gets out, sometimes they get stuck like that. Oh, uh, okay. These are very, very prehistoric Because it's muddy, creatures. right? Yeah, they're very prehistoric creatures. It's very sandy. Um, they also get impinged. So we talked about uh, the issues with coastal development. So there are things out there that they get stuck in too, and they can't get out. So we rely on a lot of uh, volunteers to help us go up on these beaches around the low tides and help flip over these crabs that get stuck. Aww. It's like you scratch my back and I'll yeah, not and that's poke why you in the eyeball. return the favor. Ah, I get it. I turn them in over. <laughs> They're not doing anything for you. I was though. hoping we'd see a, a gull or something so I could make a good uh, gull joke, but uh, we're not. You can make the gull joke if you want. <laughs> So what is all this grass? This is all one species of grass, yeah? Yeah, so this is all, uh, it's, the common name is smooth cord grass. Okay. Uh, the scientific name is Spartina alterniflora. Okay. Um, so this is, they come in two different forms. Is that pickleweed? That is pickleweed. Pickleweed. Yes, it is. Um, so there's two forms. So if you look over the marsh, 
The stuff that's in the um, kind of areas that are a little bit more flooded, that's the tall form of Spartina alterniflora. Okay. And then the stuff that's up here that doesn't get flooded quite as much uh, is the short form. Okay. So it helps you get an idea for as you look over the marsh, you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be walking with my waders over there because there is a creek cutting through right there. So um, when we're doing field work, it does help us kind of get an idea for where we're going to maybe top our, our boots. And the other thing we, we can point out around here, so I mentioned the wading bird nesting area. And one uh, plant that they really, really like to nest in, that they're nesting on those islands, is actually right along our path here. This stuff over here is uh, it's called Iva fructescens, otherwise commonly known as marsh elder. Oh, okay. And the wading birds really like to nest in that. They also are mixed is it in alder with... alder or elder? Elder, elder, elder. yeah. Um, and it's mixed in with um, Phragmites, which is that reed that's in there. And the wading birds will nest in that as well, as well, as long as it's not big stands of it. If it's just a small stand like this, they do like nesting in that as well. Cool. So these are all really important plants uh, for some of our sensitive nesting species. So don't mow it. Yeah. Don't mow it. But Phragmites uh, can be an issue in is some areas. There's a gravestone so out there? What is that? What do you see? <laughs> it looks like a gravestone out there. <laughs> Just are some a, just of our old structures. So oh, okay. again, uh, hurricanes did come through there. So there are some remnants of some old structures. Or um, is that your boathouse out there? It is. Yeah. Nice. So we're gonna head down there, see if we can see some things at the ramp. It is a low tide right now, so we might see some good things coming up um, in the marsh. But you can see here also. So we mentioned the osprey platforms, and we mentioned the uh, purple martin gourds. The other thing we have out here, we have some other kind of uh, houses. And those are for our tree swallows. Not the houses back there. Those are people's no, condos. those are people's condos. And then right here up close are our um, tree swallow boxes. So again, uh, that is another uh, bird that's nesting on our property that we monitor. And there is stiff competition with some non-native species in some of these uh, boxes. So uh, European starlings are a non-native species and they're out-competing some of the martins and the, and the swallows. So it's really important if people want at home to put up some of these boxes. I know I have bluebird boxes in my yard um, and the bluebirds love it. Did you know that we brought starlings here? Yes, we did after yeah. Shakespeare because they were mentioned in the poems and people wanted them here. Did you know that there was the American Society for Introduction of Non-Native Species that was founded in New York City in the early 1900s that was specifically designed to bring non-native species into this country? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm not even joking with you on that. I have to tell my students that every single year. We literally brought non-native species because we wanted to make it more like Europe until we realized that was probably a bad idea. Oh so we have some more signs over here. Uh, I mentioned Iva. This is also another species we have along our trail, which is northern bayberry. Mm really cool plant. Uh, they can tolerate poor soils. They have a really aromatic leaf What's if you want to take a whiff thing? of it, crush it up and smell it. I love the smell of bayberry. What's this? With all the... That, that's bayberry as well. Oh, that's ba... Oh, that's oh, cool. Is it? Is that bayberry? No. No, that's, that's the Iva. It's oh, just flowering okay. right now. It got me thrown off. That's a very tall Iva. Or the marsh elder. It smells like a leaf. It smells like a leaf. You don't smell it. It's hard to smell through the mask. I lost my sense of smell in the war. <laughs> that I was never in. <laughs> never in. So you mentioned bayberry as being an important plant. There's a, um, and Sam mentioned that we have tree swallows nesting here on the property. Tree swallows are a fascinating swallow. They are the only swallow that can actually eat bayberry. Most uh, of the other swallows are strict insectivores, meaning they'll just eat bugs. Tree swallows will eat bugs and bayberry. Oh, cool. That allows them to migrate south later than most other swallow species because they have a food source they can take advantage of. They can also return sooner in the spring. So It's like me. I can eat Italian food and I can eat Mexican food. That way I can travel anywhere in the United States. There you go. You're all set. Yeah, I'm all set. So the tree swallows do that as well. They, they decide, well, if there aren't insects around, they'll just eat bayberry. And then when the insects come back, they'll eat the insects. So it's a very another one of those native species that's really important to protect. It's a good I didn't thing know I can that eat about Italian food swallows. because New Jersey just doesn't have anything else. That's really <laughs> it's just Italian food. 
I tried finding Mexican food, but there's really no good Mexican there's food. And once much. you've had Texas and Oklahoma barbecue, I mean, coming up from Louisiana, I mean, I was right there in Texas all the time, Louisiana, but there was some good Mexican down there. It's hard to find it up here. Yeah. Oh, are we going up? We could probably get some closer looks down here if you want to look, and then we can maybe move over there. Let's see what we can see down. So this is our boat ramp here. So when we're doing research, this is actually where we launch. We can't launch at this tide because it does, Aaron's probably going to fall in the marsh any minute if he keeps going. But it does get pretty squishy. It's all right. I was in a lake all day the other day, <laughs> swimming around. So we got all kinds Ew, of... Ew, it's gross. Squishy, gross squishy. We got a lot of snails. We got to get here. we gotta get back to Hank before we end this live stream. We to find do. Out I really want to end it so we can see if Hank ended up getting them. Yeah, we got to get to Hank. Hank a fish. Oh. But in, in a container. In a container. So we want to see if Hank could open that container and get oh, that fish. Yeah. So before we end, we need to get back there and see if he was ever able to get his fish. I watched Hank pull himself into one of those big uh, water jugs to grab a crab. It was fascinating. Right. I love the yeah, way you say the word fascinating. Crab? It's like Sheldon from the Big Bang. Fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> Let's see if we can get any. So that uh, that little crab we fed the... Very windy. Sorry, guys. I don't control the wind. That little crab we fed the terrapins usually are seen yeah, out here. Yeah, they're usually around. They're, uh, they're not out right now, but um, coming down this channel, you can see a lot of terrapins basking. Today, I don't see quite as many. Hard to see from this distance, but... Sometimes if you stomp the ground, you stomp, stomp the ground, and uh, it makes them come on up. That's why the birds, like the sandpipers, they stomp the they ground stomp. to try to make them come up because it mimics rain. And so they're like, oh, I want to do it. I want to come on up. Yeah, piping plovers are great at that. This is a beautiful piece of property. You guys really maintain this wonderfully well. And there's uh, our beautiful research vessel to your right here. This is the... SS Mama Chug. Um, beautiful is a That's what we slight know overstatement it as, it's right there. Muddy but, you know. and gross. <laughs> it's a work vessel, folks. We That's do a, a work lot of good You guys need an boat. airboat. When's the airboat coming? Well, I'm actually airboat certified. Are you really? Yeah. Well, why don't you have one then? Well, they're pretty expensive, but... No, uh you just get a gigantic fan. And you know what? Our marshes aren't nearly shallow enough to drive that around. Oh, really? It would be in the channels, and those things are not meant to be Coast Guard approved. They're not meant for deep water. They don't do very well in the deep water. Yeah, and you know what guys, so I, I told this in another live stream, but you really don't want to take a motor, in any kind of motor, into shallow waters because even a, even a, a airboat is going to disrupt the sediment and the muck, and that's just, it's, it's going to disturb the ecosystem. So if you're going to do anything, just take some waders and wait on out. That's what or we a do. canoe. Canoes work great too. Yeah. So I don't see our other research technician, but we have some uh, nodes up along the way. You can see right there. Oh yeah, the telemetry them. things. So yeah, so we do tag the terrapins so the little, again. The little, the little. Antennae. You can go on our website in the virtual terrapin station and learn more about some of the terrapins that we have tagged. Um, but we put transmitters on them and those little nodes we call them right there help us figure out where the bird where the birds where the terrapins are it's like moving gps for turtles within our our marshes here so we've learned a lot about movement if the turtles had a smartphone and they could operate it with their little claws they could find out exactly where they are and where the fish are yeah but they don't it's unfortunate when's that coming out <laughs> you guys gonna get a turtle phone maybe you should start that one Aaron. There she is. So she's got a little See that bird out. all the way in the distance? That's not a bird. That's a that's a that's a human. <laughs> Alright, let's see if we can intercept her. She knows we're on the prowl, so she knows it's a possibility. But um, she has a little handheld unit right there that she's using to manually track those turtles. And then these so that's called active monitoring. And then there's uh, these nodes system here that's passive monitoring. So those are kind of collecting the data and she can go out there and actually get a real pinpoint of where those turtles are located. Hey Lester, you're watching. We gotta up our game at Stockton. What are we doing? We're not monitoring where turtles are. <laughs> Man, all John's doing is, is just raising a bunch of hatchlings up. We gotta we got up our game. You guys have all the fun technology. 
And we do this work with uh, CTT, Cellular Tracking Technologies. Um, they're located right here in Cape May. Um, and they're the ones that help us develop some of this stuff and uh, work with the proofing and getting it set up and everything else. So they've been great partners to work with on some of this research. And hopefully next year, we're planning maybe this year, this might be in our future to try this on birds at some point. You're going to put little GPS transmitters on birds? Yeah. So where do you put the, where do you put the GPS transmitter on a bird? Like on the leg? Uh, no, usually we do some kind of uh, backpack attachment. Put a little backpack on a bird? Yeah. <laughs> like a door of the Explorer backpack? <laughs> we can put a backpack on them. Small. Or um, the kind we're opting for are leg harness so it looks like a backpack but it's actually just around their legs so it's okay. not around their whole body it's just on their upper legs and then attaches onto their back and that doesn't bother them either it does i mean as long as you're attaching it right again you have yeah, to be, you got to do it you have right to have the right training and you have to know what you're doing which i have done a lot of transmitter attachment through the years and i've done some training sessions with uh ctt so um we're again going to work with them to make sure we're wait, very wait, confident wait. in it. Are you also a bird nerd? I am a bird nerd. Oh, yes. I think she's a bigger bird nerd than Devin. I don't know about that. Devin, Devin's a very, very... I mean, he is the one with the <laughs> like telephoto lens yes. that yes. probably costs more than my house. Yes. Although I live in Jersey, so that's probably not Devin, true. Devin is out there every day birding. I thought I saw a crab. Nope. Okay. It's I thought you were gonna jump in. I was excited for a minute. I I um I, I would do that if I weren't holding <laughs> something that could electrocute me. I can hold it if you want to jump in, Aaron. There's there's video of me doing that too. Look at the Wetlands Institute. Changing the subject. Brian Williamson says John and Lester got the turtles healthy into a great size this year. We couldn't have tracked any of the turtles without the great care they got at Stockton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still saying we need to get transmitters on the turtles. So Brian Williamson, he is our research scientist that does the work here with uh, Diamondback oh, Terrapins. Oh, okay. So he's one of you guys. He, he was just, he was just defending them. <laughs> he is trying to make it known that you guys are doing an awesome job. I know we're doing an awesome job. I still want turtle. Oh, look at what kind of butterfly is that? Oh, man. We lost it. Yep. Uh, the buckeye, I think. The buckeye. Lester says Stockton raises the Diamondback Terrapins for the Wetlands Institute, the Wetland then microchips and or tags the Terrapins, John Rakita and his staff raised. Yes, I know all of that stuff. I could have told them that. You guys aren't getting the point. I want microchip transmitters. Microchip. Yeah, well, let's do it. Oh, goodness. I, I sense a turtle phone in the future of uh, Stockton University. Bump, 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 turtle phone. So one of the things that, um, I should grab a microphone. So, as you've kind of seen the property here, we said that, you know, the trail out there is a quarter of a mile. This is a very small piece of property. We have had a bird list of 236 species here. So that's, that's a big bird list. Which is pretty incredible if you consider the size of the property here. So again, this is why native plantings are so important. They attract lots and lots of birds. They feed them, get rid of the invasives, get the natives in there. You can do a native garden in your own house your own backyard, you can support pollinators, you can support the birds, and uh, they need they need the help. So nice. Awesome. Doing phone. everything that you can. Yeah. No, that's Devin. okay. I'm just I'm just watching the, the, the text stream here. Brian and, and Lester are having a thank you fest. Oh jeez. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we, we are we all know how much we appreciate each other. It's okay. We are very fortunate here at the wetlands. We have some awesome partners. I work a lot with the state, work a lot with the feds, work with uh universities all kinds of people and we definitely wouldn't be able to do the progress we do without all our partners so that's definitely very important to us all right guys all right moment of truth moment everybody. of truth we got to find out if hank the octopus got the jar open and ate guys... the fish let's see oh i don't see it in there hank it looks like he might have gotten it hank oh He's engulfing it. I can't quite see if... Oh, wait, guys. What is this? Does that mean he got it? There's the jar. Hank got the jar open. Hank. 
You're my hero. I think Hank got it. I can't quite see what he has right yeah, now. Yeah, he's all the way in the back. I don't think he has anything. But I think he already got that jar. Oh, you guys can't see oh, wait, it. Oh, wait, no, he, wall. he has the jar. Oh, he still has the it jar. Is, it is open, though, and the fish is gone, so he got that. Oh, so fish. now he's just playing with the jar. He's just playing with the jar. <laughs> Hank, you're my man. It's a very smart creature here, guys. Is he going to go to you? He's actually changing color, so you can kind of see... <laughs> If you watch him long enough, you can kind of see all his emotions changing in his color. It's pretty neat when you watch him. He's like the original mood ring. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. There's a jar. There's no fish in the jar. Looks like he's uh, moving his tentacles around there trying to get the last scraps if there's anything. Yeah, there. I see it. Good job, Hank. Good job. All right, Bye. folks. Well, see you guys later. Oh, I'm just showing you. Bye, guys. Thank you for joining us. This was awesome. Thank we you hope so you much. Get more involved in some of our education programs come and see us um, we'd love to have yeah. you guys visit us anything that you are interested in volunteer work or if you're interested if you're doing homeschool and you want to bring your students here you bring your children here um, by all means just look them up they're more than happy to educate that's half of their mission here is educate the other half is to do research and they are more than happy to, to show you guys around uh, check out their website if anything else and if anybody's watching this after the live stream ask questions and I'll get back to you or somebody from the Wilton's Institute will get back to you. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you.